Thank you, Daniel. Good Thank morning. you. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. And uh, after uh, indeed he hearing a lot of academic talks, it's also very nice to uh, be able to tell you a little bit on what's, ha what's actually happening um, uh, out there and see how we can learn from, uh, from each other. Um, but before we go into the current situation, I would like to take you uh, about 10 years back. Um, at those days, I was in charge of a company, uh, and in that company, we were planting and restoring and protecting forests around the globe in several countries in order to fight climate change. Carbon sequester carbon, uh, sorry, forests uh, sequester carbon, uh, and by that way, of course, you can fight climate change. And at a certain moment, we were visiting one of our projects, it was in Uganda. And we encountered a situation where the local communities had actually gone into the forest and illegally cut it down. And that was the forest that we had planted in order to fight climate change. Uh, and when we discussed, as you can see here above, when we, we, when we discussed with the people on the ground, it basically became clear they did not need forest, they needed food. They, they needed land to grow crops to feed their children, or they needed income in order to buy food for their children. So, uh, basically they told me, listen guy, if you want us to save forest, fine, but then you should pay for it. Um, and that actually made me clear that there is something fundamentally wrong in the global economy, and it still is today. Think about this, trees are worth much more if you cut them down than when you leave them standing. And it, that's actually completely opposite to what it should be. Trees, they, they present an enormous value to, uh, to the uh, uh, global economy, but that it's just not valued as such. Now, uh, that might, may sound just like a story, but it actually brings me to um, the two questions that I would like to uh, discuss with you today. First of all, can we create new disruptive business models which actually enable sustainable behavior instead of unsustainable behavior? And secondly, can we use data and technology to create smart, clever, easy, and energy-neutral households? Now, these questions, they may seem different or may seem to have nothing to do with each other, but they actually do. And in the coming 20 minutes, I will, I will try to explain how. And of course, I am convinced that the answer to both of these questions is yes. And I will tell you how we are actually uh, doing it. Because at current, and we are a renewable energy company in Holland, so we provide energy to already thousands of households. Uh, in current, this is actually what we're doing. We are continuously trying to solve these questions by, by building business models, by building products and so on. And the way that we do it is by turning things upside down, which, which we believe are wrong or which we believe are fair, or, 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 or uh, uh, not right for economy, and so on. So if you look at this animal, it's a sloth. Uh, you might think it's just a stupid animal hanging upside down. But actually, it is very clever. It is hanging upside down to save energy. It's feeding itself from leaves, and in leaves there is not much energy, so it has to eat all day and the rest of the day it needs to rest. And the way it rests is by hanging upside down and saving much of energy. So this animal, just as an example, choose to go the opposite way. And that's the same that we are doing in our company. We came up with the idea to establish an energy company that sells as less energy as possible. Now that might, may sound strange, of course. From an economical point of view, I would like to sell as many energy as possible. But our strong belief is that if we sell less, we actually add value to the global society. Uh, so based from that idea, uh, we continued and we basically built our company. Uh, and we took elements from which we believe in the, let's say, old economy, they are wrong, and we changed them. So, for instance, um, the business model in itself. I would bet you that 99% of all the companies in the world make margin on whatever they sell to you. So if you buy more, they will make more money. That's how it works. So we changed it around. We said, no, we are not going to do that. 
if, uh, if you use more energy, and that's not what we want, but if you use more energy, I don't want to say or make more money, so it will be the same for me. So we said we will charge a fixed fee, a fixed monthly fee, and sell you the energy at cost price. Uh, the same with discounts. We don't give dif di discounts if you buy more. We give you a discount if you buy less, because then we have succeeded and actually helped you to save energy. And we've helped you to create your own energy, for instance, with solar panels on your roof. Uh, so we did this transition thing throughout the entire company uh, and came up with a structure that actually worked. Our, sh our customers, they are co-shareholder. We are a, a cooperation. Uh, our our we believe the value of our company is not just a financial value. We shouldn't calculate it on financial values alone, but also on social value. And think about it, we're not a charity. This is not the idea of a charity. We are a commercially activity, but we only believe that it should be done in different ways. Now, enough about ourselves. Um, let's look about the energy sector a little bit more. Because although not many people are already seeing it, but in the energy sector, we also see uh, a shift, or you could call it a turnaround. On your left, you see the traditional energy situation, where we have big utilities, big energy companies, and they basically do two things. They either turn the power plants on or they turn them off. That's basically their business. And the more they sell to you, the better it is and the more money they make. I may overdo it a little bit, but that's sort of the way it works. In the new situation, which you will see on the right, uh, it's changing from centralized to decentralized. So instead of having consumers that energy is floating to, we now have prosumers who is, who is also, also flowing or creating an energy flow from the households with their solar panels, uh, uh, whatever you name it, into the grid. Um, and it's not only solar panels, it is local uh, solar projects that is crea being created, local biomass projects, there uh, are uh, wind, pro wind projects popping up uh, all over the place, people have electric vehicles that need to be charged and discharged, uh, some people invest in, uh, in batteries, Tesla just, uh, just uh, uh, introduced uh, their own uh, battery into the world. So you see, instead of a, a one stream flow of energy, it's and, and money, uh, it's now a multi-stream flow of financial means and energy, and that all needs to be managed properly. So as a result, IT comp I'm sorry, energy companies, they are changing from this traditional supplier role to a much more IT role. They need to live from data, and they need to live from smart applications, apps, and so on. And what you already see happening is that the big IT companies in the world, like like Google and IBM, uh, they are actually entering this market and they are building platforms from which people can manage their own energy situation. Now, what we've done, we've made use of this and we established what we call our own virtual renewable energy grid. And in that grid, uh, our customers or our participants, they can choose from which project or location they get their energy. So we, we established a wind farm, uh, for instance. And that wind farm, it wasn't established under our private company, but we actually gave it to our clients, so they own it. And they could choose to get the energy from that wind farm. But they could also choose to get part of their energy from maybe a solar, uh, a solar project nearby, on a school or some other uh, building. Uh, they could also use to make they could also choose to make use of storage. They can also choose to uh, make use of their own solar panels. Uh, and besides the fact that they can actually choose where they get their energy from, we also provide them with um, inside information on what they are using themselves. With just a simple device like this, it's actually pretty old fashioned, piece of plastic and some chips inside, you can install it directly to your energy meter in your house. And once everybody has a smart meter, we don't even need it anymore. And it gives you inside information real time on your actual energy usage. Now the question is, is this what people want? Because it sounds nice, 
But ask yourself, are you truly interested in energy? Do you really want to know how much energy you are using on a daily basis? Probably not. It's my work, so I'm, 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 I'm pro, but uh, I think most people actually, uh, met mo uh, actually, uh, actually don't. So we need to create benefits, because for most of the people, energy, it's just the, 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 the thing that always works. There's always energy coming out of the plug, so there's never an issue. So it has to be cheap and easy, and please don't bother me about it. So we need to create benefits, and that's where we need to make the connection with uh, what Daniel already called the Internet of Things. Because so far we have discussed the energy network, which is basically out there, uh, which is smart in a sense, or it's getting smart in a sense. So now let's look at your own household, what's actually happening within your walls. What we see happening is that homes are getting smarter and smarter. You can actually, maybe even from here, do certain things in your house. Turn lights off, uh, uh, maybe turn your water pump on, uh, just m m maybe something on security level, that's uh, something that you could do. I could ev even take my iPhone here and turn the heating system at my house at this point a little bit lower. I think my family won't really be happy with me, but I can do it. Now, the thing is that it's all still, it is smart, but it's still one direction. It is me giving some orders to my house to do certain things. Um, so think a little bit further. We have a smart house, or it's getting smarter, as I said. And we have a smart energy network. Um, the only th problem is uh, that they are not connected at all. So we have two smart networks, so to speak, and there is no connection between them, making the whole stupid again, if I may say. So that's what we're trying to change. Um, and by connecting these two elements with each other, we can actually start doing some really nice stuff. Imagine it is windy outside and the sun is shining. Uh, at that point, we are actually able to charge all the batteries that you have in your house, to start your dishwasher, your dryer. If you have an electric vehicle, we can charge your vehicle. So we're going to make optimum use of the, the windy conditions, let's say, out there, of the energy which is, uh, which is available. At this moment, that's absolutely not the case. Vice versa, when it is at night or, 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 or when there are other moments when energy is not available, uh, we can then turn your, or your, your systems and equipment a little bit lower, uh, discharge the batteries, maybe even discharge electric cars and so on, and create a continuous balancing act between demand on the one side and uh, uh, the, the, the actual energy capacity on the other side. Now, still theory, but we decided to try and test and see if it actually works in the real, in the real world with real consumers. Um, so we are running a test. Uh, we, in total, we already now have uh, 60,000 households that we provide our services. Uh, and we approach a number of them and ask them if they would want to participate in a test where we would go one step further. Um, and we're doing that right now with 300 households. And basically what we do is the following. We, through an app, we send them every day information on the energy prices for the next day. So today I will get and uh, uh, I will get a message in my app, and it shows the energy prices for tomorrow. Divided by the hour, so it's not one price, I will see prices divided by the hour. Based on that information, I can make my own choices. I can decide to charge my vehicle at the, let's say, the, the, the energy happy hour, uh, and save money, uh, and vice versa. Uh, now, this is, of course, only the beginning, but it, we, we are testing and seeing how it works and if people are actually doing it. And uh, the first results show that without losing any comfort, people can save easily 10% on their energy bill, uh, regardless of, of, the, of the benefits that they can actually create uh, with regards to sustainability. Now, this is only a first step, uh, because, of course, we will take it much further, uh, because the technology is already there, and. During the last uh, two days, I've been intrigued by all the 
people talking here and all the workshop of what is already possible to, uh, to do, and we are working on that as ourselves as well. Assume that you can actually easily get warnings if you exceed a certain energy level, if you use too much. If you allow your service provider, I wouldn't call them energy company, but service provider, to actually interfere a little bit in your household, they can turn on machines and turn them off at the right, correct moment. And of course, you can make a choice. In my strong belief, people will, through an app in the future, make a choice and say, hey, I'm a green person, so please manage it in such a way that my energy is always green. Or somebody else says, no, I'm more into comfort or I'm more into price, make it as cheap as possible. There are several ways that you can start managing uh, uh, your energy household. Another thing we're working on is that we're trying to recognize the energy uses within houses. Through that tiny box I showed you, we have inside information on, on the exact energy uses during the day, and we're trying to find out whether we can recognize whether it is a, a washer or a dishwasher or a dryer that, that's being turned on. And you can actually then get a advice and get, a, get a, 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 a message from us saying, hey, in our belief, it might be so that your dishwasher is 20 years old, and maybe it's time to replace it with a much more sustainable one, much more safer one. Um, so there's all kinds of things which are there for the grab, basically. They are already happening, some, some a little bit more, others a little bit less, but they are there to use. Now, the only thing is that um, we are working in the Netherlands in a highly competitive market. The energy market, it is still dominated by uh, three large energy companies. Although the market was already liberated 15 years ago, it's still the three formerly government-owned companies that dominate the market. They still own 75 to 30% or 80% of the market uh, with regards to clients. So they're not really happy with these new disruptive, let's say, fighters like, like we are. Uh, and they have a lot of marketing power, so we, that's what we encounter every day. Uh, so the, the cost to entry and the cost per sale, the cost to, to find your clients is actually quite high. Even though we know that when we have the, the possibility to talk to people, like I'm doing here, we can actually convince people. Uh, but the problem is that in the end, energy for most people is still, it's there. It's there and, and it's not that you think about. Uh, we found out that uh, when people choose a new energy supplier, in most cases they choose for a free iPad that they get with their new contract, instead of gre the, the, the real green supplier and so on. Uh, although we see a, a good, uh, good shift. Um, so it really needs strong marketing pressure. You need to focus on creating benefits uh, for our clients. And luckily we are able to succeed in that. We see that by Divert, uh, by, by changing the model, going the opposite route, uh, people actually gain from it. They, they have benefits. And whenever we, uh, whenever we feel bad again and we see a lot of pressure from, uh, from our peers, or sorry, from our competitors, uh, we go back to uh, where I started uh, by thinking the opposite way. You can see an ugly wind farm up here, but you could also see uh, a nice park to play in. Thank you very much. Uh, where can we surf this wind, wind farm here? Uh, we still need I to run, run some tests, test, uh, okay. yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> safety, safety tests? <laughs> yes, okay, exactly. Okay. exactly. We could maybe produce energy. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah that's, indeed, that's a good idea. Okay, thank you so much. So she, they're, they're just doing it, which is amazing. Uh, now, you've been through several stages. I mean, the, the companies lived several lives, as I understand it. Maybe if, if you were talking to somebody in Switzerland or France who said, okay, I want to do the same, what recommendation would you uh, give them in order to maybe bypass a number of initial steps? Yeah. Um, I would say uh, create a diverse team. Uh, because when we started, we were with a team of people and they all wanted to save the world. Uh, so we were all very highly intrinsically motivated. 
and, uh, and we were convinced that everybody out there is, is, is the same and actually wants to change. Uh, but that's not always the true, or not, that's not always uh, what people triggers in their da daily choices. So what I would say is create a diverse team and also get commercial people in. Get people in who know about marketing. Uh, don't be afraid to, uh, to have good discussions and to, to fight each other over certain elements. Because the more thoughts and the more angles you, you, uh, you take into account, the more success you eventually will get. Second question, well, I saw the what next uh, slide, and I, I thought of a lot of innovative service in, uh, and ideas. How do you work on innovation? Do you work internally, or, or uh, do you, are you running open innovation programs? Are you working with innovative communities? Are you welcoming external applications as we well? Do, we do, actually. We, um, we do, uh, I mean, to be honest, we do a lot of innovation ourselves within the company. But like I said, we are also a cooperation. Um, so we try to co-create with our clients as well. So every couple of months, we invite a number of uh, uh, our clients, have good discussions with them, and have a good interaction, and see what kind of uh, ideas we, uh, we get from there. So we, uh, we do pay a lot of attention to co-creation. Thank you so much, Dennis. Thank you very much.